Well, I thank you for being here this evening. I, uh, I, was, I was sweating a few minutes ago. I had goosebumps all the way through that song. It was just beautiful. I want I, I bring you greetings. Uh, the uh, old timers from Kwamba, from Paul Walker in Grand Junction, Colorado, who was a part of your flock some 30 years ago and still thinks of you fondly. And uh, he sent me a note this morning to make sure that I said hi. I got to spend a couple days with him uh, over the past weekend out in Colorado. And uh, just a dear brother. Love him to death. And uh, so greetings from, from Grand Junction to you folks. Um, my only regret about tonight is that you have to hear me preach and not Ivan. And uh, I, I, am, I love that man so much and I'm so glad you're here. And uh, it's a privilege to consider him a friend and a mentor. Isaiah chapter 44. <clears throat> when uh, Ivan and I were putting this little series together, um, which really was just born out of a desire to uh, expose our folks to the Word of God as, as much as we could, uh, and to join together uh, flocks um, to, for, to just enjoy each other's company, um, Ivan has uh, asked that we do a series on idols of the heart. And uh, so we are going to begin that this evening just with really an overview, uh, try to lay some groundwork. Isaiah chapter 44, let's begin reading in verse 6, okay? And we'll read through verse 20. Listen to the word of God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order, from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile. And their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn, so he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm, I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. They do not know, nor do they understand. For he has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I've burned half of it in the fire and also baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it, then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. And he cannot deliver himself, nor say, Is there not a lie 
in my right hand. Father, as we <clears throat> open your word this evening, I thank you for the privilege that is ours to be gathered together in this place. Thank you for uh, building your church. Thank you for calling us to Christ and allowing us the privilege of gathering together to enjoy each other's company, to enjoy the grace of God in each other's lives, and to sit under the instruction of your word. And now I pray that you would uh, make this time profitable, and that you would fulfill your promise to never let your word return void. And grant me grace as I speak, so that this would be of some help to us. Incline our hearts to Christ. Turn our desires from idols. In Jesus' name, amen. This is quite a text. Idols of the heart. I want to talk to you about the danger of idolatry and also the relevance. Uh, my goal is really to just kind of introduce the series to us this evening. Uh, understanding that a study that we would call idols of the heart needs to take some time to define what idols are because if we just relegate idols to something that loincloth wearing, wooden spear throwing, bone in the nose tribes buried deep in the jungles of the southern hemisphere uh, might keep in their mud huts, uh, at, at best we'll find the study quite irrelevant. And at worst, we, we could become self-righteous after all, I don't worship idols. Uh, and, and therefore become immune to what the Bible has to say about the subject. And believe me, it has a lot to say. Well, the most obvious response to idolatry from, from a good Christian, or from anyone really who would read this text, is how stupid do you have to be to bow down in front of a block of wood and think that it actually does something? How stupid must have the Old Testament Jews been to continually forsake God to bow down to carved stumps? And in a way, that response is entirely appropriate. That's what you're supposed to say when you've read this text, at least up to verse 17. Verse 18 to 20 answer that question for us. And the answer is quite sobering. We'll, we'll get there in a few moments. I didn't really ask Ivan, but I'm guessing that the title for our series is taken from uh, John Calvin's statement in his first volume of the Institutes of the Christian Religion when, when Calvin says, The human mind is, so to speak, a perpetual forge of idols. And if Calvin is right, and some would say Calvin is always right, and you, and you don't have to, I'll, I'll love you anyway, but if Calvin is right... If he's right, embedded between our ears is a blacksmith shop. And the blacksmith of our heart's desires is swinging the hammer of our thoughts, crafting one idol after another, day after day, year after year. Calvin goes on to say, The human mind, stuffed as it is with presumptuous rashness, dares to imagine a God suited to its own capacity. As it labors under dullness, nay, is sunk in the grossest ignorance, it substitutes vanity in an empty phantom in the place of God. To these evils another is added, the God whom man has thus conceived inwardly, he attempts to embody outwardly. The mind in this way conceives the idol, and the hand gives it birth. Our, our minds conceive of idols, and our hands give them birth. The text here in Isaiah 44 is a taunt. It's mocking. It's silly. It's meant to make us say, that guy's an idiot. It's not unlike, I think, the tone that Elijah would have struck on Mount Carmel as he mocked the prophets of Baal who were prancing around. But idolatry is also a really serious matter because those who worship idols according to Revelation 21.8 will be cast into the lake of fire. The Apostle John closes his first epistle with these words, Little children, guard yourselves from idols. 
And, and I don't think that's a useless or flippant warning. If we're not careful to guard our hearts, we, we like the Israelites, did time after time after time after frustrating time. As you read through the Old Testament, you say, stop it already. If we are not careful to guard our hearts, we, like they, will go running after that which is not God. So let me take you through this text as best I can. I want us to look at, first of all, the characteristics of idols. We're going to look at the characteristics of idols, the appeal of idols, and the danger of idols, so that we know what to look for in our own heart. Characteristics of idols. First of all, idols are created. Verse 9. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile. Idols are created. They come from inside of us. They are not imposed on us from the outside. They come from within. You know, the first words of the Bible, Genesis 1, introduce us to a God who is uncreated and He creates. In the beginning, God, where did He come from? He just is. He is self-existent, uncreated, but He is a God who creates. But idolatry takes that on His head. Because idols come from a created person creating his own God. And just as God has created man in his own image, when man creates an idol, he does so in his own image. So verse 9 says that people fashion graven images. Verse 12 to 14 describe the process of creating an idol. In verse 12, we find our idol maker in the shop making uh, an axe or, or a knife or a cutting tool. Uh, by the time he's done, it says he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's weary. But, but if you don't have an axe, you can't have an idol. So the man works on. He uses his axe, verse 13, uh, his chalk line, a planer, a compass to make this block of wood into the image of a man. And, and then we find that our idol maker is not just a blacksmith, he's also an arborist. Uh, verse 14, he is cutting trees, he is, he's planting them. It says he raises the trees among the trees of the forest. That, that means he's selected them, he's cared for them, he's pruned them, he's put time and energy into making good trees out of them. And then some of them he cuts and he uses them for firewood. And some of them he turns into idols. In verse 16, he takes one big log from the same tree. He cuts it. He, he, he hauls it home. He cuts it in half. He turns half of it into firewood. And he carves the other half into an image. And he falls down before it and worships it. Uh, I think Isaiah is speaking with a sense of sarcasm, a little irony. Showing us that, that making this image has made him hungry. Verse 12, he's thirsty, he's tired out. Uh, verse 16, he's cold. Okay, His wife has kicked him out of the house. Um, that's, that's where your wood shop goes anyway, guys, outside. And that's where he is, he's cold. And so on the firewood half of this log... He's got two halves, right? Firewood and idol, okay? God and, and lumber. The firewood half, he makes supper on, and he, he's satisfied, verse 16, and, and he's warmed up. Uh, the irony is that the half of the log that he's burning is actually doing him more good than the half that he's worshiping, okay? You see? At least he gets some supper, and some warmth out of it. Something good comes from it. Uh, that half of the log that is not his God helps him to recover from all the work of creating his so-called God. And that's kind of silly, right? That's stupid. But the point is this. The man has created his own God, but the God of the Bible is self-existent and uncreated. But at least if you create your own God, you can get a God that you can understand and that you can like. You can appreciate. So that's the first characteristic of idols. They're, they're created. Secondly, they're culturally driven. They're culturally driven. The idiocy of idols is driven by a community of idol makers. Look at verse 11. It speaks of the companions of the idol maker who are told to assemble 
and to be ashamed together. And, and idols of the world and idols of the heart are created within culture. And, and whatever was important within a culture, the culture created an idol to meet that need. So if survival was paramount, as in ancient times, the gods of the day were gods of rain and sunshine, and that kept major crops come in. And as things like irrigation and advancements that in farming that make survive, basic survival more predictable, more of a given, uh, the gods tended to be gods of pleasure, especially of sexual, physical pleasure, fertility, and so forth. And these gods came out of the culture in which they were formed. And the same is true today. I came across an interesting editorial in the Washington Times, I think it was on Monday, and the title was Mr. Obama's Hot Flash on Global Warming. And, he, and here's a quote from that. The wealthy West preaches the need to make carbon sacrifices to Mother Earth so that once satisfied, she will bestow cold weather on us. This is language that we can understand, right? Making carbon sacrifices to Mother Earth. Spoken tongue-in-cheek, but... The point is well taken that a unsaved author may identify the gods of the age and sacrifice in the worship process, at least in some form. But idols can be difficult to spot because they're really they're, they're just reflective of our own culture's deepest desires, which uh, usually become, without us knowing it, our own desires. And those desires can be sexual, homosexual, monetary desires, desires to be famous. That's the whole premise, right, of the reality television, an American idol. We want to be famous, have the desire for power, and influence whatever our culture says is good and healthy and helpful it makes a god of those things and such is the case here in verse 11 the idols come out of a culture of idol makers letter c idols are meant to meet deep needs idols are made to meet deep needs look at verse 17 It says this, he falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. Now we're not told what difficulty and hardship was facing this particular fellow, but we know that he found himself in a situation that he couldn't control and a situation he couldn't get out of. Maybe he was a slave. Maybe he was in great debt. Maybe he was suffering from a terrible disease. Maybe he was suffering from good old-fashioned guilt. Maybe he was suffering from broken relationships. We don't know. All we know is that he prayed this simple but telling prayer, Deliver me, for you are my God. We set up idols because we have problems that we can't solve, and we have desires that we can't by ourselves fulfill. And so we reach out to someone who is more powerful and able to help, or at least that we perceive. And as silly as that seems, the solutions that we come up with, as long as our culture says it's a real, viable solution, we'll, we'll be tempted to try finding our deliverance there, be it education. Your problem is you're just not educated enough. Go to school more. And, and I'm not knocking school. But it's not the solution to the deepest needs of your heart. Self-esteem is a huge solution to an array of problems. Your real problem is you just don't think enough of yourself. Security. Physical fitness. Any number of offered solutions. Our culture tells us, try them. They will meet your deep needs. What, are the, what is the allure of idols? Those are some of the characteristics of idols. Let's look at the allure of idols. What makes idols so alluring? Because they're presented to us as ridiculous and silly. Uh, and especially so because we create them in our, in our own image nonetheless. I mean, the guy makes a block of wood that looks like himself. Really? 
But probably the reason he does that is because he's unable to come up with anything better than himself. So he just makes it look like himself. But beyond that, why, why is it that we, we as believers who would know the God of the Bible, still be tempted to turn to idols? Why is it necessary for John the Apostle to say, guard yourselves from idols? They are, after all, just useless blocks of wood, either physically or metaphorically speaking. Let me give you, I, I think i got four reasons why idols are alluring. Number one, idols may be predictably manipulated, but God is sovereign. Idols can be predictably manipulated, therefore they are safe, but God is sovereign. False gods, idols operate on a quid pro quo basis. You know what that is? It means you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Okay? You do me a good turn, I'll do you one. We have uh, in our culture the favor system. He owes me a favor, I owe him a favor. And idols work the same way. And because they work that way, they are safe. You do what they ask and they give you what you want. That's safe. Even angry gods, so-called, can be appeased by an appropriate sacrifice. But one of the scariest truths of the Bible, when you really start to learn it, although it's one of the most comforting ones, but at first it's the scariest truth, is that God is sovereign. He does whatever He wants. And sometimes He does what pleases us, and sometimes He does what we just don't understand. If God were like an idol and manipulate, manipulable, manipulatable, able to be manipulated, if that was God, we would all be rich, right? We would all be healthy. We would all have rock-solid marriages and obedient children. Those are desires that we have. And if God wanted us to be really happy, we may suppose He would do those things for us. After all, His power and His love is unlimited. God loves me. God has unlimited power. He, therefore, He's going to use it to make me have whatever I want. But what are we to make of a God who can heal but lets our loved ones die? What are we to make of a God who is rich beyond our comprehension and lets us languish in poverty? What are we to make of a God who may at any time restore all our broken relationships, but He doesn't? Here in Isaiah 44, we find a man crying out, Deliver me, for you are my God. God doesn't always deliver us like we want Him to, when we want Him to. And we, we have to know that it's not because He can't, it's because that he won't for reasons that we might not understand or we might not even appreciate them if we did understand them. Even if he did explain to Job why he lost his ten kids, would Job have been satisfied? It's difficult at times to really believe the words of Jesus when he says, don't worry, for your heavenly Father knows what you need. But idols can be manipulated and they are safe but God is sovereign and so they can be alluring secondly idols are appeasable idols are appeasable but God is never appeased by sinners idols are notorious for having low moral standards are they not if they have them at all there's a great debate going on in the temples of one of the great gods of our day, the god known as the National Football League. And this debate goes something like this. Should wife abusers be allowed to play football and earn the adoration of millions of fans? Should they be allowed to earn a paycheck? This is the debate, debate that rages in the temples of one of the great gods of our day. And I'm not saying don't want fo football, but... The, the answer to that is still pending. Uh, and, and we've already decided as a culture that we really expect unfaithfulness and promiscuity from the rich and famous because they entertain us. They take our minds off the troubles of life one quarter at a time. 
And so now our question is, what is the level of violence we will tolerate? But God, on the other hand, holds a standard that is so high that we must all suffer eternal punishment in hell. We can never, never be good enough. We have to throw ourselves on God's mercy. We have to turn from sin and to Christ. We can't stand before God on our own merit. And to proud human beings, that's a huge turnoff. In fact, God's moral standard is under attack today. There's even a movement within so-called Christianity to convince us that God loves homosexuality because it makes people feel loved and happy. It's hard to imagine a God who wouldn't want me to be happy, right? Certainly God will, God will accept my behavior because he's sure to have seen the same light our culture has finally seen in the last 10 years. The, the truth that it doesn't matter who I go to bed with, whether I'm married or unmarried, my gender or the other gender, God just wants me to be happy. But God isn't appeased by, uh, out of our sin. And he's not talked out of his morality. And so the remaining option is just to create a new God in our own image. And that tempting, temptation is overwhelming to some. And by the way, there's, there's a Christian version of a marriage between all of these. Uh, the appeasable idols and unappeasable God and um, predictable idols by, with the sovereign God. There's, there's Christian versions of how they marry themselves. Number three, the allure of idols. Idols offer immediate temporal, physical rewards, but God is eternally minded. Jesus says, lay up treasure in heaven. And that's not always easy because treasure laid up in heaven doesn't tickle my fancy here and now. It's hard to enjoy it. But idols offer satisfaction and enjoyment and, and peace and prosperity now. They are, after all, in our image. And what we want, they want us to have and to have it now. Frankly, God's seemingly endless patience can get annoying at times. He's got so much time. Even the psalmist finds himself saying over and over again, How long, O oh Lord, how long? And idols offer what we want now, while God is eternally minded. And fourthly, idols are visible while God is unseen. Idols are visible, God is unseen. That, this is really more powerful than it might seem at first. The second commandment uh, of the ten is the prohibition against crafting a visible image of God. Don't make any graven images. But we are visible, physical people. God is unseen. Jesus said no man has seen God at any time. But we are bombarded with the temptation to see some physical representation of God. We just want to see it so we can know for sure it's real. Know that it's there. And, and whether it's books like Heaven is for Real or 90 Minutes in Heaven or, or somebody I just read just spent eight hours in heaven, so-called, we're tempted by that desire to have some, something physical, some physical hook to hang our idea of God on. Something we can visualize, something we can see, something we can touch. Listen again to the theologian of the 16th century speaking of the Israelites building a, crafting a golden image or a golden calf and calling it Jehovah God. They knew indeed that there was a God whose mighty power they had experienced and so many miracles, but they had no confidence of his being near to them if they did not with their eyes behold a physical symbol of his presence. They desired, therefore, to be assured by the image which went before them that they were journeying under divine guidance. And daily experience shows that the flesh is always restless until it has obtained some figment like itself with, with which it may vainly solace itself as a representation of God. In consequence of this blind passion, men have, almost in all ages since the world began, set up signs on which they imagined that God was visibly depicted to their eyes. 
You know, increasingly in our day and age, there is a discontent in Christianity, a discontent with a God who is invisible and works in invisible ways. There's an increasing desire to see God's presence manifested in some way that we can get our eyes on, get our hands on, uh, manifested in the form of miracles and healings and ecstatic speech and so on and so forth. If we could just see God, we'd feel so much closer to Him, we'd actually know that He was here. And that temptation gets so strong that, that we may, like this guy here, actually create our own God or, or take those seeming phenomena and stand in awe of them as if we had seen God himself. Lastly, I did have a fifth one. Idols are finite and bound to a location, but God is universally and infinitely God. This is part of the allure of idols. Idols are finite and they're stuck in a particular location. But God is universally and infinitely God. Idols have limitations and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, really. The good part is idols are limited in power and location so we can run away from them if necessary. Okay. The bad thing is they can't really do everything, they're just more or less specialized. So you have to have a God of this and a God of that and a God of so forth. God, on the other hand, is infinite. Again, good and bad. David said if you went to the remotest part of the sea, even there God was present. Well, if you're Jonah, that's bad news because he tried it. Our God reigns supreme, and to those who love Him, that's a wonderful truth. We sang, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. But to those who don't like God because they don't like His laws, they don't like His sovereignty, they don't like the fact that they can't manipulate Him, the universality and the infinite nature of God is really a hateful thing. And they find it far easier to disbelieve, ignore and just to replace with a God of lesser power. So what is the danger of idols? Why do we have to guard ourselves from idols? Well, if it's not from those allurements. The text tells us that the danger of idols is simply this. We are blind to their stupidity. After mocking and making fun of, the ding-dong in verse 9 to 17, who cooks supper over half of his log and worships the other half, listen to what the Bible says. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I've burned half of it in the fire and also have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it, then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? We may say, I know God, I love him, I am of all people not susceptible to idols. But this, this verse tells us that when we serve idols, we don't even know it. We don't realize how stupid we can be. It's easy to mock our idol builder friend, isn't it? What a dolt burning half the log and worshiping the other half. But this is the dangerous part. He doesn't understand what he's doing. He doesn't know that he's being a fool. We haven't talked a lot about the downside of idolatry, the, the horrors of it, the awfulness of it. Let me, uh, we've just kind of made a mockery of it with, with the prophet. Let me talk to you about the Old Testament idol, Molech. Molech was a god who had the body of a man and the head of a cow. Uh, his hands were outstretched, palms up, and the statue itself was hollow. There's a little opening in the bottom of the statue. You could reach in and build a fire inside of it. 
And when the fire had heated up so the statue was red hot, an infant or a young child would be placed on those red hot hands. The mother standing there was not allowed to cry. And if, as it roasted to death, the child would begin to cry, there was a band standing nearby and drummers would bang their drums and pipers would play their flutes and drown out the cries. Apparently, from what I read, as the child burned, the cheek muscles would pull the edges of the mouth back and they would say, look, he's smiling, he's happy to be there. This god Molech was one of the most hateful to God and for good reason. And we ask ourselves, what could possibly possess a mother or a father to set their little child on those hands? What kind of insensitivity, what kind of cruelty could stand by with no show of emotion, tapping their feet to the rhythm of the band while this baby burned to death? And the answer is here in Isaiah 44. They don't get it. They don't know how stupid they are being. And even to this very day, right, to the tune of a million babies a year in this country alone, not to mention the hundreds of millions worldwide, babies are slaughtered, offered up to the gods of convenience or population control, freedom, women's reproductive rights, whatever else, and they don't know the depravity of what they're doing. Let me bring it a little closer. There's hardly anything really that that grieves me more than to know that in our communities, our parents who Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, rather than take their children to the house of God to worship Him, they take their kids to a baseball field so they can hit a leather ball with a stick or a soccer field to kick a ball into a net or a basketball court to throw a leather ball through a metal ring. Or take them to a football field to push a leather ball over a white line or or a ballet stage so they can dance around on their tippy toes. And at the end of the day, that's what those activities are. But to, uh, but to our society, they're not. They're, they're important. They're significant. They matter. They're more important than, than worshiping God. Certainly those things aren't the same as Molech. And on the one hand, it's not, don't misunderstand me, athletics are well and good, Uh, ballet, uh, I hope you understand, these things can teach character, perseverance, and discipline. I I get all that, I played sports, I love doing it, but, but we can take our children and teach them that the God of popularity, the God of applause, the God of, uh, of whatever advantage there ultimately is to kicking a ball harder than anybody else. If that is more important than being in the house of God and worshiping Him, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. We, we dare not sacrifice the souls of our children upon the altar of whatever God is, is ruling our day. Why would we do this? Because we don't see. We don't know. We're we're blinded. Our hearts are so easily, verse 20, deceived. We don't see things for what they really are. To this man in Isaiah 44, this wasn't a block of wood. It was his God. And if he could see it for what it was, he would be ashamed. That's verse 11 and verse 9. The day is coming, dear brothers and sisters, when we stand before God and when we do, we will see things for what they really are. We will understand then. But notice the helplessness of the situation. Verse 20. He cannot deliver himself nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? You know, we need the gospel. We need it really, really bad. We need it to be saved and we need it to live day after day after day. We cannot deliver ourselves from idols because we can't even identify them. Here's a guy with an idol in his right hand and he can't see it. He doesn't know what it is. This is our condition without Christ. And this is the condition we can so easily fall back into even as Christians. 
the mockery, the laughter that we rain down on this idiot in Isaiah 44 will be, if God doesn't open our eyes, rain down on us one day. In the coming weeks, we'll be addressing in more detail, and, and Ivan will do a far better job than me, of working through the specificity of some of the idols our hearts create, and, and I'm sure the exposure will be shameful to us as God opens our eyes, but it is better to be ashamed now and turn from idols to serve with all our hearts the living and true God than to have our eyes opened on the judgment day when it's one day too late. May God be merciful to us and open our eyes to see our own idols and may he remove the deception that covers our hearts. And may our hearts be fully and finally inclined to follow after him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being with these dear brothers and sisters tonight. I thank you for the privilege of being in the presence of the one true God. And oh, Father, it is a sobering thought that we too might be like this guy that we've read about and worship and serve things that are not God and have no clue. Father, remove the scales from our eyes. Show us the beauty of Christ. Help us to resist the allure of idols. Help us to guard ourselves, guard our hearts from the idols that are continually cropping up from within us, O oh Father, from around us in our culture. Father, if you do not save us, we are hopeless. And so help us, for Jesus' sake, 